Welcome to Game Foundry Reviews. In this video, we're going to take a look at Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep is a worker placement game set in the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Let's jump right in with the description of the rules, see a few example turns being played, then I'll be back for some closing remarks. This is Lords of Waterdeep, set up for a two player game to set it up. Each player picks a color and takes the corresponding player mat in that color along with the agents. Depending on the number of players, you're going to get a different number of agents. In a two player game, each player takes four agents. In a three player game, each player takes three agents. And in a four or five player game, each player takes two. And then in addition to the agents you've taken and put on your mat, you put uh, one here under the fifth round space like so. And then you pick a start player who takes this uh, castle first player token and gets four money. The next player in clockwise order will get five money and then six money and so on until all players have starting money. And then you shuffle the Lord cards and give one secretly to each player. They might uh, look like this, and that gives them an ability that gives them some extra points at the end of the game. And they keep that face down under the board. They definitely do not want to show anybody what Lord they are. Next, each player gets a hand of two Intrigue cards, which are for their eyes only, and it's a hand of cards that they can play during the game. They can certainly keep them near their board. Lastly, each player gets two face-up quests that they put on the active quest side of their player map. And uh, these are what quests look like, and the players will be completing them during the game. Um, the rest of the entry cards form a face down stack, and the rest of the quest cards form a face down stack, but also four quest cards go face up on these corresponding spaces of the board. You also form stacks of three victory points each on each of the eight round spaces, like so. And then you shuffle up the building tiles and uh, lay out three face up in the builder's hall spaces here. And lastly, you just form a pool of the money um, and the adventurers, which are just different colored cubes. And you also have the ambassador and the lieutenant who might come into play later in the game. So the game is played over eight rounds, which are represented by these numbers here, one to eight with the three victory points on them. And each round has a few different phases. It's just the start of the round, the player actions, and then the end of a round. After the eighth round, there is a final scoring. And uh, whoever has the most points wins. So let's go over what you do in a turn. So to start a round, you just take the three victory points from that round and lay them on each of the three face-up buildings. There's always going to be three face-up buildings, and some of them over time, if they're not bought or built, will get additional victory points laid out on them. Also, some buildings have effects that take place at the start of a round. They would take place at this time. One other thing to note about the start of a round is at the start of the fifth round, each player gets an additional agent to their pool that they'll be able to use for the rest of the game. So after setting up for the round, players take their actions and they start with the player with the first player marker and they go clockwise. For your turn, you must place one agent. If you're out of agents, you are out of the rest of this round. And you place them in any space, any built building, you see the spaces for them here, or any space already on the board. And we'll talk about a few of the special ones uh, right now. So as soon as you place your agent, you take that action. You don't wait till the end of the turn. Most of the spaces uh, you can see here just give you that many cubes. So if I went here, I would get two orange adventurers in my uh, tavern, and I would just put them here so everybody can see them. But there are some spaces that are a little bit different. Probably the simplest is the Castle Waterdeep. You take the start player token. You don't become start player till next turn, but then you also draw an intrigue cart. Um, now a little more complicated, the Builder's Hall. There's only space for one guy here, but there's three possible buildings you can build. And you build them by paying the cost, and then you take that many victory points immediately, and you move your scoring marker on the track uh, that many points. And then you would build the building. So to build a building, you pay its cost, and you put your marker on it. So for the rest of the game, it's marked as being your building. And now anybody can take this action in addition to all the actions on the board, and a new one is flipped. Um, it still has to follow the rules of being unoccupied. So now that somebody's in Builder Hall, for instance, nobody else can go there. He can only ever take unoccupied uh, actions. But if a player besides the owner of this building takes it, the owner will get some type of benefit generally. Like for example, if someone else takes his action, the owner gets two points. So it is good to get some buildings out there. Most of the spaces only allow for one agent to be placed there, but the Cliff Watch Inn actually has three spaces. Um, this space just gives you one of the face-up quests and money. This one gives you a face-up quest and an intrigue card. And this one you actually get rid of all four of these first and you put them in the discard pile. You flip out four new ones and you pick one of those. So in all cases you're going to get one and these are all three so potentially in, in successive turns one player could ultimately fill all three of these spots during a turn. But remember, you only place one guy per turn then the next player goes. And the last kind of fancy space is the Water Deep Harbor. So when you place, there's again three spaces to place. If you go first, you should place in the one, and certain the same person could certainly take two or three later on. But in order to place here, you have to play an intrigue card. If you don't have any intrigue cards, you can't 
um, play here. That's really the only way you actually get to play them. There are other cards that allow you to draw them, but you just play them from their hand, from your hand and do what they say and discard them. Unless it's a mandatory quest. One type is a mandatory quest, and there are these quests here. They're generally pretty cheap, but the rewards aren't so good. And you put that in front of another player, and that player has to complete that mandatory quest before completing any other quest. So that can be a little bit frustrating for them. Um, also, at the Waterdeep Harbor, at the end of the turn, after everybody has placed all of their agents and taken an action in number order, so it starts with one, then goes up, these players get to reassign their agent to an empty space, still has to be empty, but they get to take that action. So you essentially get to do two actions in a turn if you uh, place on the Waterdeep Harbor. So after placing your agent and taking an action, the second part of your action turn is to complete a quest, and you're limited to one quest per turn. So even if you wanted to do a whole bunch of quests, or even if you wanted to complete a mandatory quest and then another quest, you'll be out of luck. You can only do one quest per turn, but you do get as many turns as agents you have in your pool. So you can do many quests over the course of a round. The way to complete a quest is you pay the required amount here, and then you take the reward. Also, you just flip the quest face down in your area here, unless it is a plot quest. And uh, you know if it's a plot quest, because it has the, this little thing here, plot quest, and it has a special ability. When you complete them, you just put them face up next to your area, and for the rest of the game, you have whatever ability is in that plot quest. So they can be very powerful, but the rewards tend to be a little bit less. So you have to decide what you want. If you want to go for some points, or you want to get some more abilities. Like this one's very expensive. It costs a lot of cubes, but it's worth 25 points, which can be very helpful. So after everybody from Waterdeep Harbor has been reassigned and taken their action, the round ends and players take back all their agents to their uh, personal mats. And then play continues with the new start player if uh, somebody went here. Otherwise, the start player stays where he is. So the game ends after the eighth round. And at that time, there's the final scoring. The final scoring is pretty simple. You get one point for each uh, cube you have left in your area or each adventurer you have left in your area. You get one point for every two money you have. Lastly, you get points for your Lord. So for example, this player gets four points for every Arcana quest and four points for every Skullduggery quest that they completed. And the quests identify on them um, very clearly what they are along the top. So this would be an Arcana quest. So this player might want to do that because it's going to be worth four extra points to him or her at the end of the game. Whoever has the most points wins. Let's get going with this example playthrough. So the first thing we're going to do is at the start of the round is lay out the victory points like so. And then it's going to be the black player's turn because he has the first player uh, token here. So he's going to go first and he's going to place his guy um, somewhere and then take an action. So he's going to first go here to build. And now he has to pay um, so many uh, money depending what he wants to buy. So he's going to build this. So he immediately gets one victory point for doing so because there's one on it. He places it out here in one of the building spaces, sticks this on it. Also, when purchased and at the start of the round, place four money on this. So to make it easy, we're going to put the four money that this costs right on it because it has that effect. And that effect is going to take place at the start of every round from now on. So if you place on this space, you get all the money. But the owner will get two money. Unless the owner places, remember, the owner only gets the benefit if someone else places. So he's done that. Now he's completed his turn. He can complete a quest. Um, but he doesn't have quite enough resources yet to complete either of the quests in front of him. So now it's the yellow player's turn. The yellow player really wanted to go there, but now it's occupied, so he cannot do so at this time. He is going to go here, and he does first, he plays a uh, intrigue card. So he's going to play this one, and he just chooses one of the following to take. He decides that he uh, really wants to take one white um, cube. So he takes the white cube and puts it in his supply. But later, he's going to get to move here again. So then the black player goes, and um, he decides he would really like some black cubes. So he goes here, and he gets two black cubes. And play proceeds like this. We'll join back up at the end of the round so you can see what that looks like. Welcome back. The players have now placed all of their agents. And note that the yellow player has even completed a plot quest, so he now has an ability. And remember, you can complete one quest per turn, not per round, per turn after you take an action. Um, but now there's some guys on the water deep harbor, so we resolve those. Yellow goes first, and yellow is also going to go second, and then black's going to get to go third. So for yellow's first guy, he's going to put him up here and take to orange. Now, as usual, he could uh, complete a quest as well, but he's not going to do so at this time. And he's going to go here and draw an intrigue card, um, which goes to his hand, and take the start player token. So he's going to get to go first next time. And then lastly, um, Black decides he would like a new quest, 
and along with it he gets to draw an intrigue card. So he's got a whole bunch of quests here that he could complete. Is he going to complete any right now? Um, no, not yet, but he's getting pretty close to where he'd be able to. So then the next round starts, just the same as the first. We lay out these, and note that some of the buildings now, when you build them, are going to be worth additional points. Each of these will be worth two. And this has a start of round effect where you add uh, money to it. So this can be worth quite a bit of money. So we'll jump back for the final scoring to show you what that looks like. Welcome back. The eighth round has just finished, so the game is over. Before we do final scoring, I do want to point one thing out. All uh, 10 building spaces on the board are filled, but they aren't limited. So if, uh, if it was another round or another player had chosen to build during the game, they would just put the building somewhere else. It's not limited to those 10. But anyway, let's go with the final scoring. So the first thing in final scoring is the number of adventurers left in your tavern. So this player has three, so he gets three points. And this guy over here has three six, so he gets six points. Next is one point for every two money. This guy has eight money, so that'll be four more points. One, two, three, four. And this guy has 18 money, which is nine points. Lastly, we take a look at the Lord cards. Um, this player gets four points for every Skull Duggery and every Arcana quest that is completed. Mind you, it has to be completed. It can't just be there. Um, so he's got eight. So that's going to end up being 32 points. And this player had the guy that gives four points for every Commerce and every uh, Piety. So he's got six total, so that's going to be uh, 24 points. So the black player wins. Lords of Waterdeep is a great introductory worker placement game. It's very simple. Um, you just place a guy, take an action, and all the actions are very easy to understand. Most of them are just take cubes. Also, I want to point out that you need to know nothing about Dungeons & Dragons to enjoy this game. Um, believe it or not, I actually taught this game to a couple that had never heard of Dungeons & Dragons, and they enjoyed it just fine. It's also real neat how over the course of the game, people build buildings and add more actions to the pool. So as things get a little tighter at the end, and you have a lot of quests in front of you, and you want to complete them, you have more different ways to get there. But you got to remember, you got to pay the owner some type of bonus in many cases by taking those actions. So this is a good one to check out. It's kind of a light to medium weight game. If people enjoy worker placements or you want to introduce somebody to worker placements, and again, that, that Dungeon Dragons theme is, is neat, but has absolutely nothing to do with the gameplay here. So if you're really into D&D &D and you're thinking this is the next D&D &D thing, it's not. But on the other end, don't be afraid of it if you're not into D&D. &D. It's a very good, very strong, very streamlined worker placement game. That's Lords of Waterdeep. Check it out.